That's it. So I'll turn it over to uh, John N-A-U-R, the time cuts genius and uh, designer of this here board. Thanks, Guy. Uh, when we started designing the Tangerine SDR, one of the things that was important was the ability to do, do science. Sorry. This is better? Yes. Uh, one of the things that we wanted was the ability to do science grade data collection, which uh, requires being able to time tag, know when the stuff you're receiving is coming in. So for that, the radio needed to have both uh, an accurate frequency reference and a time source. So uh, we decided to design a, a GPS-based uh, time and frequency source for that purpose. As you'll see, it's actually going to be useful for more than just that. Um, the requirement for the Tangerine was we needed to have an output at 122.88 megahertz to drive the, the RF module. And the brake receiver, uh, which is one of the Hamside projects, will require four uh, different HF, basically local oscillator frequencies. So uh, we, a simple 10 megahertz only would require more external stuff uh, to make it do all that. But we also wanted to have 10 megs available, uh, and uh, uh, that, that will be uh, something you can get if you need to. There's also something that the scientists like called total electron count, and it's a way of measuring uh, what's going on in the ionosphere, and mo uh, modern GPS modules that have dual frequency receivers are able to generate the data that provide that yield. So we wanted the option uh, to provide TEC data uh, for the science users as well. So uh, to meet all that, we set some specifications uh, that we thought would be sufficient. And we wanted the, the long-term frequency accuracy to be better than one part in 10 to the 12th, which is uh, one part in a trillion, I think, if I do the math right. We wanted the stability, how much it wobbles around, to be at, uh, one part per billion or better. We wanted to be able to get accurate time within 100 nanoseconds and uh, the jitter on the, the pulse per second signal, how much that wiggles around, less than 10 nanoseconds. And we wanted to add some phase noise specs for the radio. I'm glad to say the design we have meets every one of those requirements and usually exceeds them by several dB, except for the last. We don't quite have the phase noise for, uh, but we don't know yet whether that's due to the temporary hardware setup or something that's maybe may a limitation in, in the design. The, the quickest ever introduction of how a GPS DO works. Basically, a, a crystal oscillator is, is very stable in the short term, but over time and temperature, it drifts and moves around. GPS has clocks that are locked to the U.S. Naval Observatory suite of majors and, and cesium uh, references, extremely accurate in the long term, but there's a lot of noise on the signal as you receive it second to second. So the idea of gps -TO is that you use a phase lock loop or something similar to uh, have the GPS long-term signal steer the crystal to keep it in, in the right place. And the goal was to kind of match the performance as the crystal gets worse, the GPS gets better, and you design it so you get the best of both worlds. This is called an atom deviation plot, and uh, you don't need to fully understand it, but it's logarithmic. The bottom is time, how often you take a measurement. If you're looking at your uh, clock every second or every 10 seconds or every 100 seconds, so it starts from point 0.1, it goes to uh, 1,000 in this uh, chart. Top to bottom is how much noise there is. Basically, any two measurements that you take, how close together they're, they're likely to be statistically. And I'm not going to go through the absolute values, but basically the top is pretty crappy, the bottom is pretty good. So ideally what you want is the performance to be as low on the plot as you can get it uh, for as long as you can get it. And that's the goal. So this is what uh, a crystal oscillator uh, can look like. This is actually the one that we're using in the synth PO. So you see it's, it's pretty good. It's nice and flat until you get to about 10 seconds. But then it starts to curve up as temperature and other things uh, start to uh, affect it. Now, this is the GPS. Now, we only start with a second because we have a pulse per second. You can't look at shorter than that. But you can see that it starts out worse than a crystal. But over time, it gets better. And if we kept going, it will keep getting much, much better than this chart. 
So the idea is you want to design something to meet what's called the intercept point of those two curves and get the optimum performance. Well, ta-da, the green line is what the Synthi GPSDO is doing. So you can see that we are uh, steering the uh, crystal oscillator in a way to get its best performance and uh, then have the GPS follow it uh, as time gets longer. So that's what a GPS TO does, uh, and that's uh, what we needed to design. The traditional architecture looks like this. You, you basically have the GPS getting the pulse per second signal, and then a crystal oscillator, usually in an oven, usually at 10 megahertz. You divide that down, usually to a pulse per second. You compare the two pulse per second signals, and then you steer the frequency of the, of the crystal until they're in phase. And you keep adjusting the, the frequency to, to hold them there, then you take the output. And that's the way virtually all GPS DOs are done. It works extremely well, but it requires several distinct parts, um, and it still only gives you 10 megahertz. You've got to generate any other frequency separately. This was our first attempt at the GPS DO, and I'm not going to go through this because it's really complicated and we threw it out. Uh, so the question was, is there another approach, another way to do it? Well, it turns out modern GPS modules, like those that were made by Ublox, um, can generate an output that they call pulse per second, but actually it can go much faster than that. Uh, depending on the model, it can go up to 25 megahertz. Uh, so, yeah, maybe there's a signal there that we can use. Uh, they also offer uh, dual frequency operation, which gets that TEC value, but also gets much less noise in the short term. Uh, and uh, so you have a single module that can generate an RF signal, uh, usually a pulse per second signal as well, and do it very well. The problem is the phase noise of that signal is absolutely awful. In the short term, it, it's wandering around, uh, and you never want to put it on the radio. So you need something to clean that up. Also, again, we need to have uh, multiple frequencies available. There are IC chips uh, that are called jitter attenuators made by some companies. The one we're using is uh, called uh, Silicon Labs. And basically, these things are designed when you've got a board full of, of telecom equipment and you're distributing your clock around uh, the rack and you need to clean it up on each board the noise that it picks up. Uh, these chips are basically designed to take an input and generate the local clocks that are used on the board and clean them up. Uh, interestingly, they include a crystal oscillator or a TCXO, a temperature compensated oscillator, uh, as part of the cleanup loop to get rid of the jitter. So, hmm, there's a, there's a loop, there's a TCXO, there's an input. So, uh, we thought maybe this chip could do something. This is a, uh, the one that we're using, it's a Silicon Labs uh, 5345. Uh, in the upper right hand part where the arrow points, that's what they call their, their uh, DSPLL, uh, Digital Something uh, Phase Lock Loop, which is extremely sophisticated and can generate any frequency from about 100 hertz to over a gigahertz. Uh, and it has this, this uh, lock to the crystal, so its output can be very clean. The chip has 10 outputs, and they can be programmed at different frequencies. They're not completely independent, but you can get a lot of different of options. It also has some ability for holdover. It remembers kind of how the frequency of the input clock was, was changed with time, and it tries to, to track that uh, when, when the uh, input signal is lost. It does a lot of neat stuff. And as a result, this is the clock part, uh, part two. It only has three components, really. Uh, a GPS, uh, this silicon lamp chip, and a 50 megahertz TCXO. We have 10 outputs, uh, one of them is at 122.88, but the others can be whatever you want. And it can also take multiple inputs. So if you've already got a good frequency reference and you just need to change the output, you can use it just as a synthesizer, uh, feed a signal into one of these auxiliary inputs, and uh, get an output that's derived from that. So if you already have a lab rate uh, GPS PO, you can use that uh, to get uh, even better performance. This is it. Uh, we have uh, some of the booth. I actually saw this in person for the first time yesterday when Scotty finally remembered to get out of, out of his pocket. Uh, this, this thing is less than 40 millimeters square. It's a six-layer board. The, uh, 
the uh, temperature control crystal oscillator is 5 by 3.2 millimeters. It's tiny. Uh, but this is the complete uh, uh, synthesizer GPSTO. Um, we use an M.2 connector, which is the same that solid state drives use. They're extremely inexpensive and they're very high speed. Uh, that was Scotty's idea. It was just a, a brilliant way to help us connect the boards together. It's initially designed to plug into the Tangerine data engine. However, because of all the cool things that it can do, we'll have a Time Nuts version uh, carrier board that will bring all 10 of those outputs out and provide some other nifty tools. So as a Time Nut, you'll be able to do lots of cool things with this. As I already mentioned, we've got 10 outputs. Uh, we get a PPS that comes from the GPS module. Um, and you don't need to have a GPS installed if you want to just use it as a synthesizer. You'll notice on the board, the right hand is the top, and that has a new blocks module modern on it. That's the ZF9T, which is a, a, about $200 dual frequency one. The other side of the board has a hole where we can mount a smaller uh, U-Box module that's lower cost. So we actually will we'll have three different GPS modules available and sort of a good, better, best performance uh, option. And as new modules come out, u tends to stick with the same form factors. So we'll be able to use different, uh, better GPSs as they become available. So the performance levels that we'll have is, is one, you can buy it with no GPS at all, in which case it's just a synthesizer. So if you've already got signals running around and you just need to make some different ones, you can do that. Uh, the bronze version, uh, I was in marketing once, uh, uses a, a very inexpensive GPS module uh, from u -blocks. They're about $15 uh, in quantity 250, so pretty cheap. Um, they work surprisingly well. They don't work as well as the more expensive ones, and they don't provide a separate pulse per second when they're generating the RF. So if you use that one, you, you don't really want to use it for timing application, but just for RF, it works very well. The next step uses a slightly fancier chip that's about $80. Uh, that works better, has the PPS. And then finally, uh, the gold version is the dual frequency receiver, and, and that module uh, is currently about $160. So you can see that the GPS module is a major part of the cost uh, in the system. The silicon lab chip is less than $20 a quantity. Uh, the TCX though is about $30. So this is really the determining factor in the cost. Uh, I have not had a chance to test the actual hardware yet because I have never saw it until today. This was the breadboard that I used for some fairly uh, serious test work. Uh, silicon Labs has an evaluation board, which is a big blue one in the middle. The thing wrapped in pink is the TCXO, and the pink is the, some foam to help the temperature. Uh, the little green boards are output couplers, and then there's a GPS module in the lower right. All of that stuff together is what's on our 40 millimeter uh, by 40 millimeter board. So this is a preliminary data from that, that board, and this is just how much the signal uh, is changing in time over a period of uh, 18 hours. So it's kind of a strip chart. Uh, it's showing phase rather than frequency, but that doesn't really matter. The important thing is you can see the, the noise level. Uh, the green is the cheapest GPS module. So it's got more uh, uh, short-term noise that also wanders around a little bit more. Uh, the violet is the mid-range module, uh, which is quieter and more stable. The blue is the expensive dual frequency module, and again, it's quieter yet. In the upper right here, um, you can get the frequency offset of the signal uh, from this chart, and uh, the cheap version and the mid version over 18 hours are about one part of 10 to the 13 of accuracy, which is about a one tenth of a part per trillion. The uh, more expensive one is about uh, 0 0.02 parts per trillion at 10 to the minus 14. So uh, you get very, very good accuracy from this thing if you average it over time. Going back to that L deviation chart I showed, this is a way to easily see the difference in how the three GPS modules work. Uh, the blue is the expensive one, the green is the less expensive one, the violet is the mid range. In very short term, they're just about the same because they all are using the same. Uh, TCXO that provides the short-term stability. 
but as time goes on, you can see that the expensive one gets better and faster. Uh, and if this was a longer plot, this is only eight, 18 hours, uh, over several days, you can see that the green one, in addition to being higher, would sort of flatten out. The others would tend to keep going down uh, further. Uh, so there, there is definitely a performance difference between the three modules. But even the cheap module works pretty darn well. It's, it's never worse than uh, a tenth of a part per billion stability, uh, which is not bad at all. Uh, phase noise uh, is important for RF. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but this is the curve um, at 122 megahertz. Phase noise scales with frequency. So uh, the noise floor here is about minus 142 uh, dB. Uh, uh, noise one hertz away from the carrier, or sorry, uh, one megahertz away from the carrier. Uh, if we were looking at this at 10 megahertz, it would be about 21 dB better. So uh, the performance isn't bad, but I was just hoping to get a little bit more than that. So the, the current status has been lots of testing on the uh, evaluation or lash up that, that I showed, and I'm still going to do some more long term. Testing. The problem is with only one of those units, and these tests typically wanting to run, ideally, I'd like to do five or ten days. Well, that's for each of the three GPSs, so that's a month of data collection. Uh, so it takes a while, uh, so I'm going to be continuing doing that. Uh, we have, I think, Scott, it's 25 uh, prototype boards that have been built, um, and most of them have the expensive GPS, but we're going to put each of the less expensive modules um, on, uh, on one, and we need to have a board for the, the, the module to plug into because, among other things, the synthesizer chip uh, needs to be uh, have its firmware loaded at boot time. If you make it follow, if you you can do it right once, but if you do, you're never ever going to be able to change anything, which, which isn't good for our application. Uh, so we need some way to upload uh, uh, firmware. Uh, Scotty is working, and we'll talk about this later. The data engine that we want, we don't have because parts availability. Scotty's designed an intermediate interface board uh, that will let us test the radio, but it will also give me the connections that I need to be able to test out uh, the, the synthesis of modules. And with that, we'll be able to do kind of what uh, final testing looks like. Um, and then independently, we're working on the time nuts board. Uh, that will again have probably 15 SMA connectors on it by the time we're finished, uh, <laughs> allowing you to get access to all of the cool IOs. And that is it, Scotty. Uh, 
uh, John Miles type uh, phase noise analysis plus my ticks for the pulse per second measurements. Yeah, so the, what we're seeing here is, is system device performance, not test system performance. Yes. For the uh, <coughs> multi-frequency GPS, which other frequencies are you using, and what antennas are available? Uh, good, good question, Phil. Uh, the, the traditional GPS is on what's called L2, uh, 1575 megahertz. That's L1. I'm sorry, you're right, L1. Uh, L2 is the second frequency that most units use, and that's what we're using currently, uh, and that's a 1275. U-Box has recently come out with a version of the chips that is L1, L5 instead of L1, L2. I have not played with one of those yet. Don't know what its relative performance might be. My understanding is that the L5 signal is better for uh, urban canyon signal to noise uh, and interference. I, I don't know if it's, if it's supposed to be quite as good as the L2 uh, phase. So we'll, we'll have to play with that when it's available, but uh, right now we're looking at L1, L2. Are, are antennas coming out that will do L5? Yeah, um, you can get uh, antennas from Digiti, U-Box has one, the hockey puck, it's about 90 bucks, and I have seen some Chinese ones that are cheaper. So yeah, the, the antennas used to be a problem for dual frequency, you kind of had to find a surplus surveying antenna, they were $10,000 new, but now you, you can get the main amount for you know, well under $100. Yeah, Mike, you were talking about the antenna. Do you have a bench on board the power antenna? Oh, yeah. Um, the, there, there is uh, um, uh, bias on the uh, antenna jack uh, from the module, so we will run a power antenna without any external power supply. Yeah, I think that's all the questions we have. Thank you very much, everyone.